Previously in this series, we talked about the resistance against the Mongols, mounted by Central Europeans, Ruthenians, Mamluks and Chinese. But of all the states to put up a lengthy resistance to the Mongol war machine in the 13th century, perhaps the relative success of the Koreans is the most surprising. For 40 years, the peninsula staved off conquest by the greatest military of the Middle Ages. In today's episode, we will discuss the lengthy Mongol-Korean War. This video is made available for free thanks to our YouTube members and patrons. We fund our free content through our program of exclusive videos made for our members and patrons, who get two documentaries per week not available to the public. We've got a growing collection featuring the First Punic War, the History of Prussia, the Italian Unification Wars, and a review of the classic text Xenophon's Anabasis. We're now covering the Russo-Japanese War and Albigensian Crusades, not to mention our massive Pacific War week-by-week -week coverage, and a massive pool of other projects. All this is made for and with generous donations from our backers. So if you're enjoying our content and want to see more and support the cause of history, consider becoming a YouTube member or patron. You'll also get early access to public content, a spot in our lively Discord server, and behind-the-scenes info and goodies. We rely on our backers to support our growing team pumping out these videos, so thank you to everyone already involved, and we hope you'll consider joining in too. The 13th century Kingdom of Koryo, ruled by the House of Wang, had successfully resisted previous northern invasions by the Kitan Liao and Jurchen Jin, who had also fought as horse archers like the Mongols. Generally, the Koreans entered into beneficial tribute relationships with these states in order to maintain peace. After 1170, the Korean kings were reduced to figureheads, while military dictators acted as the de facto rulers of Korea. General Choe chong hon took power in the 1190s, beginning the military dynasty that would rule over Korea throughout the Mongol conquests. The 1211 Mongol invasion of the Jin Empire, Koryo's northern neighbor, brought unease to the peninsula. The Korean ambassador to the Jin was killed in the fighting, while new breakaway states and Jin deserters began to harass Korea's border at the Yalu River. In autumn 1216, several thousand rebelling Kitan horsemen blazed through the frontier. Skilled horse archers, the Kitans drove deep into Korea, menacing the capital, modern Kaesong. With effort, the Koreans halted their advance. Unexpectedly, in the winter of 1218, the Mongols sent some 30,000 troops into Korea with a simple message to the Koreans. They would crush the rebel Khitans, the Koreans would provide troops and supplies to assist with this, and then would pay tribute to the Great Khan. After a brief delay in answering, the Koreans acquiesced, sending 1,000 picked troops and 1,000 bushels of rice. The rebel Khitans were crushed, and Korea began sending tribute to the Mongols in 1219. Korea's first Mongol experience was relatively peaceful. Though forced to send tribute, their cities had not suffered. The dictator Choe chong hons advancing age, failing health, and desire to pass his rule onto his son stopped him from provocating. A keen observer, he had judged the danger of this new foe, expecting the relationship would differ little from Liao or Jin's tribute demands. Choe chong hon died in late 1219 and was succeeded by his oldest son, Choyu. A military man like his father and decisive leader, Choyu helmed Koryo for the next two decades. Choyu detested the Mongols' demands, especially for valuable otter skins, desired for their water-resistant properties. While Chinggis Khan was absent in Central Asia, his chief commander Makali had been left to maintain pressure on the Jin dynasty. With Makali's death in 1223, and a reduction in the Mongol military presence, the political situation changed dramatically. While the Jin made peace with their neighbors, a Mongol vassal kingdom in Manchuria, ruled by Pushan Wenu, declared independence. He sought to ally with Koyo, which declined, but made their own moves. In 1225, the chief Mongol envoy to Korea mysteriously disappeared while transporting the annual tribute north. The Koreans insisted it was bandits, but the Mongols put the blame square on Koyo. Ugade Khan was enthroned in 1229 and demanded both Pushan Wanu and the Koreans be punished. Initially, the new Khan demanded Koyo aid in an attack against Wanu. With the failure of the Koreans to comply, 
Ugaday ordered an invasion of the peninsula, the first of six Mongol invasions. Led by Sartak Kochi, the army crossed the Yalu River in autumn 1231. The attack was overwhelming. Koyo's armies were annihilated in the field, and Kaisong surrounded. Yet there was notable resistance at a few fortified cities, especially Kuju. Famed for a victory over the Khitans in 1018, in late 1231 through early 1232, under the command of Pak So, the city withstood weeks of assault. The most famous event occurred early in the siege. The southern wall of the city was defended by Kim Kyong Son and a skilled unit of Pyo Cho, translated as Defense Command Patrol, Extraordinary Watches, or Night Patrol. These were local troops from outside the regular army, an elite militia specializing in guerrilla warfare. Sending most of the unit inside the city, Kim Kyong Son led a group of 12 picked men before the south gate. Telling them not to think of their lives and accept death as their fate, Kim and his men withstood four or five Mongol charges, girding the city to further resistance. Attacks were launched on the walls day and night. The Mongols pushed carts of dry grass and wood to the gates to burn them, only to be destroyed by Korean catapults. A tower built before the walls to protect sappers was destroyed when the Koreans dug holes through their own walls to pour molten iron onto it. Fifteen large catapults were driven off by the Korean counter-artillery. Scaling ladders were toppled by Korean pole arms. Bundles of sticks, soaked allegedly in human fat, set aflame and hurled into the city, could not be put out with water. But the crafty Koreans smothered them with mud and earth. Another catapult team made 50 breaches in the walls, which the defenders filled as they were made. After a month of terrible destruction but no success, the siege was lifted, the Mongols declaring the city was protected by heaven. Military ruler Cho Yu came to terms with the Mongols in January 1232, and was so frustrated that Ku Ju had continued to resist that he wanted to have its commanders, Pak So and Kim Kyong Son, executed, fearing that their defiance would provoke Mongol retaliation. Here the Mongols interceded, saying, Although he went contrary to our orders, he is a loyal subject of yours. We are not going to kill him now that you've already pledged peace with us. Would it be proper to kill the loyal subjects of all your cities? Still, Koyo had submitted to Satak Korchi in the first month of 1232. The tribute demands were massive. 20,000 horses, 20,000 otter skins, slaves, royal hostages, and clothing for 1 million men were demanded, alongside gold, silver, and other treasures. Appointing overseers, Sartak withdrew his forces, considering the peninsula conquered. The Koreans were less keen to comply. The demands were onerous. While Koyo sent much in gifts, it was unwilling to send royal hostages, and could barely produce 1,000 otter skins. By the summer of 1232, Choyu moved king and court from Kaesong to Kanghua Island under naval protection. Mongol officials in Korea were murdered, and the peninsula was in open revolt. Sartak returned in the fall of 1232, blazing a trail of destruction across the country's northern half until he was killed during a siege by a Buddhist monk turned archer, Kim yun hu On Sartak's death, the Mongol army withdrew. As Chui'u ably predicted, the Mongols' lack of navy would stop them from being able to get the royal court into their hands by force. The Mongols were not done with Korea, the defection of one Korean commander, Hong Pogwan, gave them control of the land north of Pyongyang, which Hong was made the overseer of. The next attack came in summer of 1235, after the conquest of North China. This campaign, led by Tangut Ba'ata, was hugely destructive. With the assistance of Hong Pogwan, by winter of 1236, he had penetrated some 470 kilometers into Korea. The Koreans could not field armies against them, and alternative strategies were developed to respond. Just as the court had fled to Kanghua Island, most of the population outside of fortified settlements fled to coastal islands or mountain refuges to escape Mongol riders. Offensives were limited to guerrilla warfare, Pyeolcho units launching surprise night raids, ambushes through mountain passes, and striking small parties. Hitting quickly and hard and using local terrain, 
these small units were more mobile than even the Mongols. It was a frustrating way of war for the Mongols, and destruction increased when they got frustrated. Fortified settlements were left to fend for themselves, and when they did fall, the destruction was horrific. The countryside was ravaged, and the death toll was horrendous. The guerrilla tactics harassed but could not stop the Mongols. Who could not bring the country to submission? Korean defections to the Mongols were enormous. By winter 1238, the Korean court was willing to come to talks with the Mongols to halt the destruction. As the Koreans feared, Mongol demands were stiff. Alongside the expected tribute, the Mongols required a census and for the Korean king, Ko Jong, to present himself to the Mongol court at that time. For the military ruler, Cho Yu, this presented an issue. His legitimacy rested on his control of the king. Mongol demands would remove him from power. Peace on Mongol terms could not be accepted as long as the Choes wanted to remain in control. For two years, the Koreans made excuses not to send the king until a distant relation was made up to be the crown prince and sent to the Mongol capital of Karakoram in 1241. The Mongols found out about the deception 14 years later. By then, he was a loyal member of the Mongol court and even married the daughter of great Khan Mung Ke. With the royal hostage and resumption of tribute, Choyu achieved a six-year truce. The Mongols still wanted the royal court to return to the mainland though, and their envoys grew ever more insistent on the matter. Choyu spent the next six years building elaborate fortifications on Kanghua Island and readying militia units, while consecrating Buddhist projects like the Tripitaka Koreana to secure heavenly favors. In autumn 1247, the new Khan, Guyuk, ordered another attack under Amukan and Hongpoguan. Again, the countryside was abandoned for coastal islands and mountain fortresses, guerrilla attacks were launched, and the northern half of the peninsula was desolated. The deaths of Khan Guyuk in summer 1248 and Choyu in winter 1249 brought a relative calm. Choyu was succeeded by his son, Choe Hung, not the equal of his father or grandfather. More arrogant and hasty than his father, he struggled to maneuver the complicated politics of Koyo and Mongol attacks, and within months he faced coup attempts. In 1251, Mung Ke was confirmed as Great Khan. Again, envoys demanded the Korean king visit the Mongol court and abandon Kanghua Island. Again, excuses were made. King Kojon was too old and sickly for such a trip, but the Koreans suggested sending the crown prince again while preparing for the expected invasion. By 1252, Mong Ke sent Prince Yeku into Korea in August 1243 alongside Amukan and Hongpoguan. Mongol envoys announced that King Ko Jong had six days to comply and meet Mongol representatives on the mainland. Though the king actually met with Mongol envoys on the straits across from the island, it achieved nothing. Once more, Mongol forces were unleashed on the peninsula while the people fled to their hideouts. Pyocho raids attacked Mongol parties, and Mongols destroyed the cities which fell to them. Yaku was held up and fell ill during the long siege of Chengju, ably defended by Kim yun hu the same Buddhist monk who had killed Sartak some 20 years prior. Ultimately, Mung Ke recalled Yaku before the end of the year due to his feuding with another prince. Amukan and Hong Poguan continued the campaign for a few more weeks, organizing a brief effort at amphibious warfare. Seven captured Korean ships landed Mongol troops on Kal Island in early 1254, to no great result. Amukan pulled the troops back in spring, returning in August with reinforcements under Jalayetai Kochi, with more demands for submission that went unheeded. Early in the summer of 1255, Jaliyurtai and Amikan fell back to the northern border. By then, aside from years of destruction and abandonment of farmland, the peninsula was also in the midst of an ongoing drought. In the first year of Jaliyurtai's command in Korea, an estimated 206,800 persons were taken captive. The suffering was horrific. Jaliyurtai's forces attacked again in autumn 1255, beginning a shipbuilding program. Frustrated with the continued resistance, 
the Mongols were considering assaulting the well-defended Kanghua Island. A sense of Jeliotai's frustration is evident in his response to the Korean envoys in mid-1256. The envoys came asking for peace and Mongol withdrawal, to which Jeliotai, incensed with Pyolcho attacks in the night, snapped, If you desire peace and friendship, then why do you kill our soldiers in great numbers? Jeliotai's withdrawal in the autumn of 1256 was no respite. Famine gripped even Kanghua Island. When Jaliyotai returned in the spring, it must have been apparent that the Choe's were hanging on by a thread. Choe Hang soon died, succeeded by his son Chue Wei, who proved a very poor choice. His attempts to win favor by grants of food to the populace and court did not offset bad advisers enriching themselves and his own poor decisions. Alienating just about everyone in the court, the pressure of the situation finally led to a coup. Officers led by Kim In-jun assaulted Choe's palace in May 1258. Choe Wei tried to escape over the walls, but was too fat to get himself over. Caught by the assassins, Choe Wei's death ended six decades of Choe military rule in Korea. Gaining the support of the elderly Ko Jong and handing out the wealth of the Choe's, Kim In-jun made himself the new military governor. However, his position was much weaker than the Choe's had been and he still refused to submit to the Mongols. Mongol envoys, who arrived in the summer of 1258, brought threats that they would storm Kanghua Island, and in August, Jaliyetai received further reinforcements. Refusal to supply either the crown prince or the king was met with unchecked destruction across the Korean peninsula. If the royal court did not come to them, the Mongols would impose direct rule. No matter how bloody the Pyeongcho attacks were, they could not stop the Mongols. Resistance broke in 1259. Revolts against military rule began across the country, and towns and cities surrendered on the arrival of the Mongols, rather than continue fighting. With food supplies exhausted, their military forces ground nearly to dust, in the spring of 1259 a peace deal was reached. The crown prince, Wang Chan, was to travel to the Mongol court as a royal hostage, the court moved back to the mainland, and the defences of Kanghua were demolished. Kim In-jun was not removed, but his power was considerably lesser than that of the Choe's. Organised Koryo resistance to the Mongol Empire was over. In May 1259, Prince Wang Chan set out for the imperial court, and inadvertently became the first foreign ruler to recognise Kublai as the next great Khan of the empire. In turn, Kublai provided Wang Chon with an armed escort to return to Korea and be installed as the new king, as the venerable Ko Jong had died in July 1259. Ko Jong had reigned through the entire Mongol-Korean War, and fittingly, he died only weeks after it ended. Wang Chon, known better by his temple name, Won Jong, proved a loyal vassal to Kublai Khan, marrying his son and eventual successor to one of Kublai's daughters. Military rule in Korea ended in 1270, after a series of assassinations and rebellions, and the Korean court finally returned to the mainland. With that, Koyo was a fully incorporated client kingdom. The king ruled in earnest, though with Mongol backing. When briefly ousted by a coup, Kublai's forces came in and reinstalled him. Yet Mongol demands upon Korea did not grow any less burdensome. Wonjong had to mobilize the Koreans for another war, this time fighting alongside the Mongols. Korean ships, food supplies and men were needed by Kublai Khan against the island of Japan, which had spurned his demands for submission. Korea was to be a launch pad for the first Mongol invasion of Japan in 1274. More videos on this topic are on the way, so make sure to subscribe and press the bell button to see them. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord, and much more. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.